Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Morning Coffee with Cameron. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I, for one, am really digging this whole post-apocalyptic haircut thing I've got going on right now, courtesy of my lovely fiance Alicia. She took me into the bathroom, sat me down on the toilet, and shaved the sides of my head off because I was looking kind of homeless. In today's video, I'm here to break down my new track for you guys, which is called That Moment in the Clearing, and this is out now with Insight Music. If you want to check the track out for yourself, you can find the links down below. So I've really been enjoying these kind of track walkthrough and breakdown videos because I think it's a cool format where I can show you guys some sound design and mixing and mastering stuff and just general arrangement and music making stuff kind of all in one go rather than like 10 separate tutorials and you guys seem to enjoy them as well so I figured I would make another one for my latest track. So keeping in line with my other track breakdown videos, I wanted to break down the inspiration behind the song, some details behind the songwriting and arrangement process, some details about the sound design and mixing, and finally talk about how the track was mastered. So before the world started ending, it was actually becoming somewhat nice outside, and I decided to take my dog out to the park and to the hiking trails and go walk around and, you know, see some trees and dirt and have some fresh air. So we were walking around a local park that's relatively close to where I live, and it's mostly paved pathways. However, there's a couple what I assume to be biking trails or something like that that go off a bit more, you know, deep into the woods and stuff. So I decided, sure, well, let's adventure that way and see what's down there. So we walked for a long time and we got to the top of the hill and took a break because we were both actually kind of winded. It was a very steep hill and it was a lot of those logs you see to prevent erosion on trails. So we were walking just kind of up these steps for probably a solid 20 minutes and it's funny because my dog is pretty small so she had to hop up the whole thing so we get to the top of this hill and it's just kind of pretty and nice so we sat there for a minute and then we started continuing down a bit deeper into the woods away from everything once we started heading down the hill i saw this kind of open clearing area that had some big old trees and it was interesting because there wasn't really any grass it was mostly kind of like dirt and moss and just really big old trees and just kind of looked like a cool area so i figured we would walk down there stop for a minute head back up head back down and then go back out to the trails once we got down to the clearing it was just kind of a cool area like i said it just had this really interesting vibe of these big old trees and you know it was very earthy and just i don't know inspiring it was just kind of a cool place to be for a minute so around the perimeter of the clearing there's a little creek running by and this kind of goes down a hill into the creek and there's all these leaves and kind of old stuff because you know nothing's really grown back yet and the wind picked up for a moment and swirled the leaves around in a really interesting way and then it picked up again and just kind of pushed all the leaves outside the perimeter of this clearing and it was just a really cool moment and something about that just kind of stood out to me and that's really where the song and the title came from. It's very literal because that was that moment in the clearing. There was something about it that just really resonated with me and I thought it was really interesting. As you may or may not know, a lot of the inspiration for my music comes from things like films or video games or paintings or things like that. And I've just been trying to exercise a better degree of self-awareness and putting a score to my own life and just capturing a bit more of my own experiences in life and putting that into my music, which I think, you know, has just been kind of cool. Beyond that, that's really all there is to it for the inspiration for the song. It's a very literal title about a very literal moment. So let's hop into the DAW and break down the production. Okay, so let's kick things off by breaking down the melodic content. So first up was the piano. This is how I start a lot of my songs like this. So this is Piano V from Arturia, and it's my preset called Cameron Piano Basic. So I have a handful of presets I made, and this is kind of my starting point for when I'm writing stuff and in this case I ended up using just the preset as it was without changing anything. The piano goes into a reverb here. This is a free reverb called Dragonfly Hall Reverb. I highly recommend the Dragonfly Reverbs. They're really really phenomenal for pianos, vocals, pads, anything like that. Uh, strings and other just melodic stuff as well. This is a great reverb for that kind of stuff. So this is the EQ for the piano. I'm cutting out some low stuff, just getting rid of any annoying rumble and cutting out some high stuff, then giving a little bit of warmth here around 150 and a little bit of a mid-range boost around 600. The mid-range boost was added later on in the process and this is because once everything was going, the piano kind of got a bit lost. So I added some mid-range information just to bring it back up in the mix a bit more. From there, that goes into a PSP old timer, and this is getting slammed pretty hard, about 12 dB of reduction on 4 to 1, and it's pretty much medium attack and release. So what I'm doing here is a really common trick for those epic cinematic pianos, and this is compressing after the reverb tail. So what happens is as the chords die off and the reverb tail comes up, you're squeezing that together and making the reverb tail really big and exciting sounding, so it just gives it a huge, larger-than-life feel to the piano. 
So I started things off with this chord progression, which sounds like this. And that was really the core of the track. You know, I just wanted to get the mood and the feeling right. And that chord progression provides kind of the flow and narrative to the whole thing. To layer that up, I grabbed a music box here. So this is Falcon. And these are just samples from my music box sample pack. So that's a free sample pack on my website you can pick up. I grabbed two samples from there that just kind of layered together nicely. And this was just to add a bit more interest to the piano sound. Because by itself, you know, it's just another kind of sad, morose low past piano sound which nah. and in the future garage style a lot of people use like a sign pluck type of thing so i wanted to do something with that just to add a bit more timbral complexity to the sound of the piano so a music box is you know the same function as the sign pluck but just a bit more interesting in terms of its sonic texture and character so i just copied the chords over and the processing over so same dragonfly Slice EQ, this is just low pass, high pass to clear out as much room as I can. I'm shaving off a lot of high end here. And this is an important detail because later on, as I add the percussion and other stuff, I don't want to use up all that high end information with my melodic content. That way my drums can be nice and crispy. So high passing and low passing as much as you possibly can on every sound is very important. Next up, old timer. Once again, squeezing that pretty good just to lift up that reverb tail and make it just a really big sound. That goes into stomp delay. So PSP stomp delay, nice analog sounding delay effect. So this is just some filters on it. Not really anything to talk about other than it's a ping pong delay at half notes. That goes into a reverser. So this is over the course of one bar. This is kilohertz reverser. And what I'm doing is using this to kind of swell into the next hit. So this just provides a bit of flow and intention to the direction of the melodic narrative i guess so this just adds a nice bit of movement and dynamic interest to the chords over time so if we play these together this is what we've got So pretty cool sound and I was really happy with that. From there, it was just about adding some pads and stuff to get the atmosphere going. The first pad is this pentatonic drone here and this was created in Falcon. What I did is actually sample this up here. So I used a Falcon with a FM oscillator on the choir female preset and then in the events I used the Falcon punch library which I highly recommend. This is random play, random note, and scale. So this is just a C minor pentatonic random thing. So I just recorded this onto a new audio track and got this sound here. Which is really not all that exciting. So what I then did is bring this into another Falcon, and this is on the IR cam multi-granular mode, and five voices, pretty spread out, and this was intended to be the main pad for the song, but it didn't really end up working out. So what I did instead is just cut off a little section of it here, and then layer that with two sine wave oscillators. This way I could get just kind of a nice moving granular drone to layer underneath things. So it ended up becoming more of a melodic element in the track rather than a pad, because I'm using this to change the voicing and the chord that you're hearing so it's a complementary layer to the piano so you'll see the uh, drone and piano hit at roughly the same time and i'm just using this to like i said change the chord change the voicing or just kind of provide a bit more interest and this plays a lot of different things over time so when you have it by itself it's just this which is a nice big droning element. This is fed into a cloud seed with a little bit of dry signal just to get some of those granular crispies, but mostly wet, relatively long, about eight seconds. This goes into MCQ, low passing and high passing, nothing else to talk about there. Slice EQ, just getting rid of some resonances here that were a little annoying, and an old timer squeezing things down just to make it a bit bigger. So by itself, it's really not anything all that ridiculous, but when you layer it with the piano, Thank you. 
you get a really nice big sound that works really well together. So like I said, I'm using this and picking notes from the chord or outside the chord just to move things around and, you know, just give a bit more change over time. Beyond that, uh, that's pretty much it. Then I just made the main pad, which is a granular sample here. So this is Reason Grain, and I'm using the Vocal Shot 126 D flat minor 6. This is from my decomposition sample pack, which is another free pack on my site. I just took a section of this and used long grains, panned them out, oscillator, and octave down. And that's really it. I didn't do anything else inside of it. This goes into another cloud seed. This one is actually mostly dry and then a little bit of wet. So what I'm using this for is similar to the pentatonic drone. I'm using this as a pad, but since it's mostly the dry signal, I'm using this also as a melodic enhancer, which we'll show here in a second. And I'm just using the cloud seed reverb as the big, I don't know, wash underneath everything. So that's a good technique to utilize. This is pretty long, about six and a half seconds, and Cloud Seed is free as well. You need this reverb, it's so dope. This is the granular pad by itself. And you'll see once we get to the latter section of the song, there's a lot more notes and stuff happening. So this is kind of what I'm doing with the pad in the composition of the track. If we take a look here, you'll see it starts off as a drone, just introducing kind of the atmospheric tension. Then we're adding some color to it with some extra notes. And then by the end of the track here, it's just a lot more complex and filling out a lot more sonic space. Once you put all this together, you end up with the majority of the track. <laughs> It was just about adding some more layers and stuff to fill things out. So at this point, I grabbed my Novation Peak and did a couple extra things. I have a pluck right here. This is actually just a classic sign pluck sound. It's not anything complicated. So that's just from the Novation Peak. This goes into an MCQ, low pass, high pass, nothing else to talk about, a cloud seed relatively long again and mostly dry just a little bit of wet to give it a bit of wash underneath it this is psp n2o i'm not going to explain this in detail but this is a shimmer reverb patch this is the routing it's a reverb pitch shifter going up and then feeding back into itself state variable filter to low pass it and a lo-fi if you have n2o you can copy these settings other than that that's all you need to know it's a shimmer reverb 50 percent mix that goes into bad tape here Bad tape is a VST you need in your life. This is something I use all the time just to add a bit of character and color and movement to stuff. So I'm mostly using this as like an RC20 type thing to add some warble and movement. So it's really slow, a little bit of saturation. That's really all it's doing. Old timer, just squeezing things down again. You can see I'm slamming this really long attack and release as well. That goes into PSP Echo. This is a nice tape echo, feedback pretty high, ping pong mode, drive all the way up so it's a really saturated delay, and then the filters. Once you put all that together, you get a really nice atmospheric pluck with kind of a saturated shimmer and a nice saturated delay on top. From here, I added this mid drone. This is really not anything all that interesting. It sounds like this. This was added pretty late in the game. This is the Novation Peak as well. I think it's maybe just like some low-pass triangles or something. But basically, there was just a bit of missing sonic information and kind of like that low-ish, mid-mid-ish, mid-region. Um, so like low-mids and then the mid section was just a little empty. So I added this just to fill it out. I'm just playing like a root and fifth type of thing. Uh, MCQ, low-pass, high-pass. Cloud Seed, this is actually entirely wet, so this is a great tool to use, is getting rid of the dry output of a reverb and only using the wet, and then you get this big... ...washy thing that you can just layer underneath stuff, so that's all that's doing. After that, I have a tool, so this is the same as Utility in Ableton. All I'm doing is increasing the volume because it was just pretty quiet, and that's really all that that's doing. So once you have all that together... Just a nice, like I said, mid-wash thing to layer underneath everything. Then from there, there's this mid-pluck pad up here. Let's 
take a look at that. So this is the Novation Peak as well, without all the processing, sounds like this. So this is kind of like a glass pluck sound I made, and this guy already had a nice reverb on it, so I just rolled with it and didn't add a reverb later, which I normally do, but in this case, I just really liked how it sounded. Uh, MCQ, low pass, high pass, the end. This is the N2O Shimmer Reverb, exact same settings, mixed in 50%. Then another bad tape. This is pretty much the same, a little more saturation, maybe a little more wow. So again, just adding movement, not really doing much else to it. Once you have all that together. Just a nice kind of upper mid filler element. And that's really all there is to the melodic section. Outside of that, there was some vocals originally in the track, but I got rid of them. They just didn't really, I don't know, they didn't really like speak to me in the end. So then I just started working on my bass sounds. So for the basses, we have Thick Boy and Nasty Boy. So Thick Boy is just your standard Reese, and it sounds like this. So this is the Novation Peak. Uh, I don't know. This is just my usual patch. It's two saw waves and a 24 decibel low pass filter with some filter drive. Without all the processing. So there's a bit of glide and then I'm manually moving the filter as I play it too. So I'm kind of opening and closing the filter depending on the phrasing of the bass line. And that just ends up adding a bit more movement to it and making it a bit more interesting. This goes into PSP Mix Saturator, 50% saturation valve 2 mode, output saturation is engaged, warmth at 5% at 95 hertz. The warmth here is actually a low-end harmonic enhancer, so this is how you can get that really nice, big, deep, meaty, chunky, thick boy thing. Uh, so Mix Saturator is a great plugin for that, that's really all that that's doing. Dynamics here is a sidechain compressor, this is sidechaining from the Nasty Boy group. So whenever the twisty Reese's hit, this will duck out of the way, which is a great trick to use when you're mixing to make sure you're not overloading your low end and eating up your headroom and just getting this big wall of bassy mess. After that is a slice EQ here. This is not really anything too interesting. I'm cutting out some sub information just for the sake of headroom, adding a little bit of 90-ish hertz and then sucking out a little bit of uh, 200 something just to clear out some mud and mostly focus on the first and second order harmonics and get rid of some of the third order, I don't know, flub, I guess is what I would call it. So the EQ actually makes quite a bit of difference. And you, you'll hear, if you have decent headphones or monitors, you'll hear the difference there that it just, it becomes a bit more clear, I think. After that is another old timer. As you can probably tell, I really love this compressor. Uh, three to one ratio and this is mostly aiming for about five-ish db of gain reduction uh, relatively slow so medium attack and release really and like i said five six db of gain reduction this is just to squeeze the dynamic range of the bass down so it's a bit more consistent and then that's all the processing there is to know about on that below that we have nasty boy which is the twisty reese's so this is two tracks and what i do is i go through and just record several passes and then you know, keep the stuff I like and cut out stuff I don't. So that's really all there is to it. These are actually the exact same patch. There's no difference between them or the processing. It's just two tracks. So I can go through a handful of times and just do several passes and keep stuff I like. So the nasty boys sound like this. <laughs> So that's pretty much it. Um, the patches themselves, actually, if we take off all the processing, they are really not that interesting. Uh, if I remember correctly, these are just square waves. I think it's two square waves with a bit of detuning, and it's a 24 decibel per octave bandpass filter, 30-ish percent resonance, a lot of filter drive, and a little bit of output drive. And uh, yeah, by itself, like I said, it's really not... really not that cool of a sound it's just all about the post processing so at this point i had these nice twisty bases but i needed to make them nasty boys and you're not gonna be able to do that without you know some nasty boy stuff 
First up is a ring mod from Kilohertz. This is basically doing what you would find with Erosion in Ableton. It's a bandpass noise mode at about 1.3k, mixed in 9%. Spread is up 36%, so this is stereo noise. This is how I get that nice crispy, crispy chicken nuggets up on top. So that goes into a mix saturator, warmth again. So I copied this from the Thick Boy. Output saturation is engaged. This just adds a bit of weight. And it just thickens up the bass in a nice way. That goes into a kilohertz distortion. Saturate mode, bias, which is DC offset, which is how you can... Uh, use Utilizing like the ring mod and stuff like that and using DC offset in this distortion is how you get those really rumbly, growly <laughs> things going on. Uh, this is driving 1 dB, really not much. Um, nothing else touched, just a little bit of drive, but mostly using this for the DC offset. And you hear now it has that nice rumbly character. This goes into a multi-pass, which is doing a lot of stuff. So this is monoing everything below 250. Above 250, there's a chorus, another ring mod at 650 hertz, uh, mixed in 30%, really wide bandpass noise again. This goes into another saturate, driving about 4 dB bias once again, providing DC offset. In the post here, I have a snap heap. This is two 4, uh, 4x slope filters. Uh, these are notch filters. These are both tied to very, very, very slow LFOs. And this is LFO 1, this is LFO 2. That way, the two LFOs are in and out of phase, and you get a lot of movement. This goes into a flanger. Flanger goes into an EQ, boosting some low and high. Another saturate here, drive of 1.5 dB, bias once again. This goes into a limiter. This is just to squeeze this whole thing back together a bit. Um, I didn't touch the settings. I actually just drove up the input gain so I could just level this guy out. Then that goes into a phaser. Finally, there's one more limiter here after all of that. Once again, just driving the input gain, aiming for a decent 5 to maybe 10 dB of reduction on that limiter, and that way I just get a nice controlled sound. So then there's the group processing. This first feeds into another old timer, aiming for about 10, 8 to 10 dB of reduction, just squeezing the whole thing down. Another snap heap here. This is for some more movement and distortion. I have a faturator with drive and a little bit of fuzz because the fuzz adds a nice crispy McChicken nugget thing up on top. Flanger here, compressor, uh, squeezing down what little dynamic range is left going for about 10 db of reduction four to one ratio fast attack medium release and then an eq here just to level things back out because it was getting a bit wacky ta-da that's pretty much all there is to that this goes into a reverb this is oral river three seconds not super wet high passed at 145 hertz low passed at 4.7k just gives us a nice bit of room and movement and then finally a slice eq here this is just cutting out subby stuff because it was really overwhelming in the mix boosting a bit of 400 for some clarity in the mids and then shaving off starting at about 7k just to leave all this up top once again for the percussions so after all that was said and done that was the music to this track. The Nasty Boy basses were added later after the drums were added because I like to work those bass lines in to complement kind of the drum groove and stuff. But other than that, everything up until the Reese was what I had made, and then I started working on drums after a while. This is the melodic group here. This isn't really doing much. There's a slice EQ, which is a low pass and a high pass that are really, really steep, 96 dB per octave. This is these two automation clips here. So this is what kind of closes off and opens up over time after every so many bars, usually every 8 or 16. Then there's a Dodge Pro, and this is what I'm using to get that nice pumping side chaining effect. I really like this plugin for that. It works super well. And it's also multiband, so if I wanted to just duck out like the low end, I can do that too. So that is really all there was to it. Once I had the piano and stuff down, another detail to talk about is the ambiences. First up, there's some vinyl crackle. This is Vinyl Crackle I recorded myself. I just grabbed some records from my collection, put them on my record player, and recorded the headphone out into my H4N Pro, and just recorded the start and ends of different records to get a bunch of Vinyl Crackle. Like, I have a huge folder of this now. So just recorded some Vinyl Crackle, and I mean, this was a while ago, 
and then pulled that from my folder. That's that. The ambiences are actually kind of fun. Uh, this is kind of a cool detail. So I think on, it was either the second or third day of working on the song, I went back to the clearing in the park that inspired this whole thing, and I brought my field recorder to the clearing and just recorded a bunch of noises at the clearing, mostly just the ambiences. So I did two in stereo to add some width and one in mono just to add some kind of crunch down the center. So those are the ambiences you hear in the track. So I brought my dog Callie back with me so you can hear her walking around. You can hear her playing with leaves, me walking through leaves. You can hear like a siren in the background. So that was the ambiences for the track. I just thought that was kind of cool. And just, you know, really wanted to put something from there into this track. This all feeds into an oral river, three second reverb, not super wet. And this is a very small detail because all things considered, these are very low in the mix. But without the reverb, and with it, I found that this just added a little nice touch of dimension and depth to the ambiences. And it's like, it's really almost imperceptible in the mix when you really listen to it. But I found that once I took the reverb away, it, it just, it felt like something was missing. So it was just a little small touch and it wasn't really even an intentional thing. I wasn't like, oh, this, you know, the ambience group needs some reverb. I just kind of put some on because I was like, I wonder what would happen if I did that. And then it just, like I said, ended up adding this nice touch of depth that once I took it out, it just felt like it was something missing. So those are the ambiences, and I thought that was kind of a cool detail. Okay, so next up, let's move on to drums. This is where things get a little tricky and a little complicated because there's quite a bit of stuff going on in here, uh, as you can see. <laughs> so once we open up the drums, there's a whole lot of things happening, but we'll kind of break this down a little bit at a time. So when I started off, uh, kick and snare, that's usually what I work with, kick and snare in like a basic hat pattern just to keep a groove going. So the main drums is the kick and snare. The kick, I made it in phase plant here. This is like a sine wave, some noise. This is really short, about 10 milliseconds, band passed at 750 hertz. So the noise is very short and that's what gives it that knock and that transient. Then here I shaved off a little attack from the sine wave. This goes into a distortion and a ladder filter. This is an envelope that's targeting the pitch and the ladder filter cutoff. So that's how I get that nice thumpy kick. That goes into a mix saturator with some warmth at 147 hertz. Valve mode 3, output saturation engaged, 30% saturation. Which makes a lot of difference without it, with it. So you can hear it really adds a nice thump and weight. The rim shot here, this is a recording of my refrigerator or my freezer's ice machine and I recorded this with a contact microphone. So it's this nice kind of chunky uh, sound. I don't know if I have the original somewhere here. Yeah, so this is the original recording. And then I just took one little click out of that and made it pretty short. Uh, I didn't touch anything else. I pitched it around until it felt right, added some output gain here. Then that goes into a slice EQ. This is just bringing up some knock here around 400, a little bit of a lift around 3K for some clarity. And for some reason I felt it was necessary to shave something off at like 15K. I'm not sure why, because I really don't think there's any high end information to that, but apparently I did. I'm not sure why I did that. Old timer, just to compress it, this is 5 dB of gain reduction, just to add a bit of snap to it, not anything too crazy. 3 to 1 ratio. The reverb is being provided down here. This is Denise Perfect Room. This is a reverb you need to pause right now and go by. It is amazing. Dark mode, uh, two and a half seconds. High passed at 150, low passed at like 8.5k. And that's how you get that nice... I don't know, snappy reverb. The dynamics on the reverb is side chaining from the drums, so the kick and the snare, so that way when the snare hits, the reverb ducks out of the way. In hindsight, I could have just used the ducker here inside of Perfect Room. I don't know why I didn't do that. I guess that's just a force of habit, really. So those are the main drums, and that's really all there is to it. There's not really any processing on them. That's just it. End of story. So from here, I started adding in some percussion. I started off with actually just these uh, hi-hats here. Let's close these folders. 
So first up comes the hi-hats here. This is some hi-hats from my workshop sample pack, which you can pick up on my website. I have this one, which sounds like this. I have this one and this one. These are all pitched down just to add some kind of nice lo-fi stuff. Um, I'm not going to go into super detail on why that's cool to do, but just whenever you're doing this stuff, high pass your hi hats. You'll see that I have all these high passed and then pitch them down. It adds a really cool lo fi effect because of the sample rate. So this goes into a snap heap. This is a low pass that's opening up based on a ramp. So a saw wave over every bar. This just adds some nice movement to the hats over time. This goes into a ring mod. These are the settings. It's on sine wave frequency of about 2K mixed in 70%. This adds some nice interest. Spread is up, makes them a bit more stereo. Slice EQ, high pass, low pass, just cleaning up as much as I can. Then this goes into a PSP stereo enhancer and I'm enhancing this by a lot, you know. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's how I got these main hats here. So that's kind of the main drum groove I worked with. After that, I added in some texture to the snare. These are some recordings of me snapping my fingers, pitch down, uh, clay plates being smashed, uh, workshop sample pack, some Foley from that, uh, battery case. I'm not sure what this is. I think it was just like a plastic case that had some batteries in it that I shook around and it made some cool noises and some branches. I just went in my backyard and recorded me snapping branches for like an afternoon. And this is what adds that nice... And by using different samples for every snare hit over uh, four to eight bars, this just provides a lot more variation to the snare. And uh, there's not really anything to talk about with these, just EQ on each one, high passing and low passing. This goes into an old timer at four to one, squeezing off about three dB just to squish everybody together a bit. And then an E27 SE, which is a phenomenal EQ you have to have. It's Oh my god, this is like one of the best EQs I own. <laughs> so uh, drive all the way up, which just adds some nice, I don't know, stuff. High passing, and then I lift at 17.5k, and this is how I get that nice kind of, I don't know, crispy top end. E27 is a phenomenal sounding EQ. So uh, that was really it for the kind of core stuff, and then I just started layering. First up, there is a 16th note hat pattern. This is from my Mori sample pack, which you can pick up on my site. I just manually placed in a hat groove and added some swing by hand. Pretty much it. High pass and low pass really aggressively on that. Uh, PSP N2O, I'm not going to explain this patch. Basically, it's just panning things around. That's all you really need to know. Uh, Dodge Pro on that just to duck it out of the way and add some groove and bounce to the 16th hat pattern. And those were really the core drums at this point. And then, like I said, this was kind of the first layer, but that was the end of the core stuff. From here, it was all about adding Foley and little details. Uh, first up here, I have recording of some keys. I have some scrap parts. So this is just a bunch of scrap metal, like in my garage. And, you know, just a lot of little things. And then some recordings from my fiance's parents' garage. A uh, bunch of little metallic hits i think i was just messing around with like her dad's tool bench or something and then just went in and cut out little clicks and pops and little little tiny noises so you'll see i mean it's just little stuff and i just chopped out little tiny bits and arranged it and that's how i get that nice metallic kind of shuffle going on underneath everything So at this point, I'm just accenting the groove. That's all that this stuff is. Coins here, these are a bunch of coin hits. Once again, a lot of different samples. This took a long time to do. So it's me just messing around with coins and I mean, just the tiniest, tiniest samples that just sounded interesting and provided some nice texture and movement. So once you add these into the groove, You kind of get the completed pattern and swing. So without the hats playing, this is all the kind of textural stuff with the main drums. Mm -hmm. 
So pretty standard, you know, future garagey stuff. And the next part that's interesting is the smash textures. So once again, at the clearing that inspired this song, I did a bunch of recordings that day. And this first set is actually just a handful of things from one of my other sample packs. Uh, this is some gravel, leaves, and yard waste, which is probably more leaves or twigs or something. These are all fed into a group here. First up is a multi-pass, which is just compressing the mid and top end and then compressing the group, making the tops relatively wide and the mids not super wide. This goes into a slice EQ, low pass, high pass, adding a bit of resonance and warmth here around 300. Then this goes into a gain, which is just cranking it up because it was very quiet. PSP old timer, this is absolutely slamming it at a 10 to one ratio, going for yeah 24 the whole time, absolutely pinned. Then this goes into an expander. So what's cool is this is sidechained from the kick and snare. And what happens is every time the kick and snare hit, you get something slightly different because it's just playing these random, non-rhythmic, non-repetitive textures. So if I solo this out and play the main drums, and relatively long release on this, uh, pretty cool sound. I really love doing this trick on drums. Below that is another set of recordings from the clearing. So this is a mono recording of me crunching a bunch of leaves and walking around and then a stereo recording of me and the dog just walking through leaves. So exact same processing. And then another dynamics here, once again, acting as an expander or actually separate processing, forgive me. So slice EQ, low pass, high pass, dynamics, expander, and then a PSP old timer, uh, four to one ratio this time. Taking off about 3 dB, really quick attack and release, a little bit of valve saturation for color. So once you put this together, and add in the other one, you get a really nice, big, crunchy textural drum set. So the drum group has a bit more processing on it. All these drums are grouped together. There's a low pass here from Slice EQ. That's this automation clip, which is just that low pass effect every so often. E27 SE, uh, 24K boost of about 2 dB, which is how I get that nice crispy detail. Uh, high pass at 30, a little bit of a boost here around 63, a little bit of a boost at 680 just for some more knock in the mid range. Then that goes into an old timer MB, which is old timer, but multiband. Um, just squeezing the tops and mids a bit, and then a lot of valve output saturation here. That feeds into another old timer. Uh, two to one ratio, about three dB of gain reduction, just gluing things together a bit. So this is kind of just using like a glue compressor at that point. And then finally, one more mix saturator, valve one, output saturation engaged, a little bit of warmth at 100 hertz, 26% uh, saturation. And that's really all there is to it. So once you put all of that together, you get the completed drums. And once you get here and start adding all the texture and stuff, so that's uh, everything there is to know about the mixing and arrangement. The only other, I guess, compositional things of note are that, especially in the melodic side, I'm not using too many tracks, and this is because I'm using a lot of reverb. And what ends up happening is rather than having you know, five or six pad and droning elements in the background, I'm only utilizing a handful of things with very long reverb tails. And the reverb tails themselves end up acting as kind of the main atmospheric pad element to the track. So, you know, that it makes my life a lot easier when I'm mixing. And instead of getting 500 tracks to work with, you know, I maybe get 10 in the melodic folder, if not less. I think in this case, we're really only using like seven things. And that way, you know, the reverb tails wash together and that becomes the main pad and because there are so many varying sounds like a music box and a piano and all that kind of stuff you get a very complex sounding atmospheric wash in the background beyond that uh similar to the pad you'll notice the piano and music box parts change a lot over time slightly different chords slightly different chord inversions slightly different voicings of chords overall and this is something that i think is a great way to i don't know enhance your production is if you're like me and you tend to work in like eight to 16 bar phrases is, or even four bars, for example, take that, duplicate it and add a variation to the same thing by, you know, making a new chord inversion or a different chord in the second half. 
then expand it again by doubling it and change everything in that second part again. So that's something I used here. Um, the main chord theme is pretty dense. Then in the intro, I took the same chords and made them less complicated and used not all of them. So this way, I'm teasing kind of the main melodic theme of the track without giving it all away in the first part. You know, I'm setting up the melodic idea and then releasing that kind of musical tension by giving away the full melodic phrasing. And then the music box becomes like a plucky arp, a more plucky arp here, uh, becomes a bit more... I don't know, tonally dense here because the chords are space, like the notes in the chord are spaced closer together. So if we take a look at the piano, you'll see what I mean. In the intro here, uh, you know, it's pretty widely voiced chords and not totally super complex. You know, we're not getting into like 7, 9, like 11, 13 or anything like that. Then here, we're giving away the full melodic phrase. Then in the middle eight, it's very closely spaced notes. Then we're releasing that tension once again by opening back up. And then we're closing things off, kind of winding down by making the chords less complex. So again, just little changes as much as you can. That really makes things sound a lot better and not so loopy and repetitive. Once I had everything done, I mixed with a pink noise reference. So M noise generator, PSP triple meter, went for minus 14 RMS. Um, I, you know... This is how I mix. I mix with pink noise, so I just level everything against that, and then I went in and did any touch-up EQ work as needed. I uh, usually EQ a lot after leveling, so I'll level things out first, then go in with my EQs and just make space for everything as much as I can. Uh, beyond just, like, you know, standard stuff where I know I'm going to low-pass and high-pass stuff, so I'll kind of do that first, then mix with noise, and then once that's done, I'll go in and touch everything up. From here, it was all about the mastering. So this is the master bus processing here. If I take this off, this is what the track sounds like. So a pretty clean mix. I was really, really happy with the mix down. Um, it was just kind of about lifting the level and adding a bit of warmth and weight and you know, giving it that nice warm hug feeling. First up is a slice EQ in mid side mode, cutting off everything in the sides below about 200. This goes into Vintage Warmer 2, a uh, little bit of drive, a little bit of knee, or just kind of the threshold, I guess, here. A uh, slight low lift at about 100 hertz, and the fat mode is engaged. So this will really make all the difference. This is without it. And bring it in. So that right away just really thickens up the track. Noble Q, which is just my go-to mastering EQ. I really love what this does to a mix. Uh, boost at 80 hertz, attenuated at 80 hertz a little bit. Uh, boost here at about uh, somewhere between 7 and 10, so I'm going to guess 8.5K. Uh, lifting that up just to add some air and crispiness up top. Valve is ticked up one little notch here. This is a trick I'm sure you've seen me use a million times. I... I don't know why I do this, it's just instinct now. I just put this on the master and do that one little tick up and then adjust the EQ as needed. And it just adds this really nice bit of crunch to the overall master. Then this goes into master comp here. This is on fat mode, gentle master preset, aiming for about one and a half to two dB of reduction. <laughs> So at this point, you know, everything was nice and thickened out. It felt nice and wide. The low end was more tame. It was lifted up a bit. The vintage warmer and Noble Q add that nice bit of richness and depth to everything. And then here it was just, okay, now I need a limiter to raise the volume. So I'm not really doing much other than just warming it up, thickening it out, and then getting ready to add some volume with the limiter. The limiter is PSP Xenon, and this is CD Master 1 as the preset. This is an incredible limiter that you should own, and this is a trick I picked up from Nam from Maor Applebaum, Applebaum. I'm not, I'm totally butchering that. I'll link his website below, but he's a phenomenal mastering engineer, and he came over to the PSP booth at Nam and was like, hey, I found this preset in Xenon called CD Master 1, and he talked about on the transient mode here, uh, this preset is on C, but he was like, if you switch it to A, for some reason it adds a really transparent bass lift. And we were like, oh, cool. So we tried it and we were like, damn, he's right. You know, it does. So now this is exactly what I do on my masters. I use this preset. I change it to transient mode A. I go uh, enable oversampling here so that it's a true peak limiter for LUFS. Uh, other than that, I just adjust the bit depth as needed. 
a release, I'll tweak it, and then I set the output to minus 1 dB for LUFS stuff and for streaming sites. Then I adjust the gain input level to aim for about 6-ish, 5-6 dB of reduction in the attenuation here. So this is what happens when you put the limiter on. <laughs> And yeah, that is the mastering job. It was pretty quick and easy. It's pretty much the same chain I use just about every time, just tweaks as needed for the song. So I guess that is really everything there is to know about my new track, which is that moment in the clearing. I hope you found this video helpful and maybe learned a thing or two. I really like doing this format because like I said, it's a, it's a cool way to show you guys like not only the sound design side of stuff, but also the sound design in context and how this stuff is actually utilized in a production and you know why it's used and all that kind of stuff so hopefully you find this kind of stuff helpful to understand you know the mixing songwriting and sound design and mastering process kind of all in one go and uh yeah that's pretty much everything there is to know about this track if you want to listen to it for yourself you can find the links to that down below this is that moment in the clearing which is out now with insight music and yeah, that does it for this video, so thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you learned something, be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys again soon.